Mic check, one, two, one, two. All right, we're gonna wait a minute or two to let people uh, trickle in here. Uh, should be live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. I'm just gonna double check that everything is uh, up and running. What's up, good to see you, data science. We're not gonna do much data science in this, but we are gonna talk about um, data management and storing data, which is relevant to data science, but we're not gonna explicitly talk about data science. All right, I think we're, I think we're up. Um, all right, who we got? We got, we got, we got Marcelo live on YouTube. Uh, Xavier, Daniel, uh, Tim, what's up, Tim? Tim's one of my audio engineers. I don't, not my audio engineer, but I, I go to Tim to help with uh, mixing stuff every now and then, so shout out to Tim. Um, yeah, I'm glad the videos have been able to give people some sense of live music. Uh, I had big plans for 2020 in terms of like, shooting shows, traveling to film fests, and all kinds of bands, but obviously none of that happened. So um, luckily I've had enough videos to work on to post throughout the year. Um, in addition to the live streams, that's been uh, good for my mental health to keep me busy, as well as giving bands and uh, people something to look forward to. So if you've tuned into any of the live streams, thank you. Um, I was always against the idea of doing live streams for a number of reasons uh, before 2020. And then <laughs> 2020 hit and I was like, all right, well, let me try it. And it ended up being something that was a lot of fun, both fun and useful to people. So I think it's something that I'm gonna continue doing. So right now I'm doing a live stream, never thought I would, I would do this. Um, um, da, 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 da. All right, we got 88 people here, George Pluck. Congratulations, I heard the news. Happy to hear, happy to see you in here. Um, all right, so we're gonna get this more or less started. Um, I'm gonna let people trickle in and I'm sure people will come and go. This video will remain up on the channel uh, after the stream, so if you can't watch the whole thing, that's fine. I'll, I'll keep it up. Uh, I have no idea how long this is gonna be. Um, could be kind of short, could be kind of long. I feel like I might go on some tangents that are relevant, so it might, this might be, uh, there might be a lot of information here. Um, full disclosure, uh, I'm not an expert in data storage. I know a bit, I know enough to get, get by, but whether or not I'm an expert is entirely relative. I'm sure there are people in here who uh, have never thought about any of this stuff and for them this will be useful. I'm sure some people tuning in have been doing this stuff way longer than I have in terms of like file management and Respect to you, uh, feel free to chime in, but I'm not claiming to be an expert, I'm just sharing whatever knowledge that I have that I've gained uh, in terms of doing proper data management. Um, Happy New Year, it's still, it's still uh, New Year's Eve here, I'm in Philadelphia, it's about uh, 1 p.m. on December 31st, so a little less than, <laughs> less than a day left to get through this mess. Not that I, ex I don't expect everything to be fixed tomorrow. Um, we still have a long road ahead in terms of things going back to somewhat normal, whatever you want to call normal, but. Um, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so where do I begin with this? Um, I should also, so we're gonna talk a lot about uh, data redundancy, which is different from having a backup. Redundancy is something that gives you protection against a drive failure. So if, if a hard drive dies, you don't lose the data on that drive. Um, redundancy is technically not a backup because if, you, if your redundant system completely fails 
and you don't have a backup, you're hosed, you're, you're screwed, you got nothing left. So um, I'm probably gonna say this a lot during the stream, but redundancy is not a backup. Even if you have a redundant system for sensitive data, you should still have a backup somewhere. Ideally an offsite backup or a cloud backup, something that gives you added protection on top of uh, redundancy. Um, we got, we got uh, Germany tuned in, awesome, cool. All right, so when we talk about data, there's all kinds of ways of storing it. When I first started filming bands for 8x6, I was literally just buying like portable hard drives and just storing all of my data on each of these things. So each of these is anywhere between, I mean, when I first started buying these, they were only coming in at like 500 gigs, then a terabyte, then, then for a while, two terabyte was like the most cost effective one that I was buying. And now you can get these upwards of five to 10 terabytes. I think these small ones may be up to five. I think you can get, you can get larger ones, larger external drives for like, a, I have a 10 terabyte larger external one. But these small ones, these are handy if you're, if you're managing just like data that you don't care about losing. So I have stuff on here that is not mission critical, like stuff that I can lose and I'm not gonna, it's not gonna ruin my day. But there are a couple issues with these drives. So um, first and foremost, this doesn't scale. So I don't wanna have to keep buying dozens and hundreds of these drives because to be honest with you, I don't know what's on this drive. I don't know what's on this drive. I could, I could label them. I could put like a sticker on here and label them, but that's not gonna be like something that I could scale. Like I'm not gonna be able to figure out quickly, okay, I changed a bunch of shit on this. What is on here? Um, the other thing is these are still acting as independent drives. And so each of these is like, like I said, a two to five terabyte volume. But what if I want to have a single volume of 50 terabytes or a hundred terabytes? Um, that's where something like RAID is useful. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the other issue with these drives is that these can fail. So if I put like, let's say I film a fest tomorrow. Not gonna happen because we're still in lockdown, but when I come home, I could put all the data on here. All the bands that I filmed the previous night, I could put on this drive. But what happens if this drive fails? I lose everything. So you might say, okay, well, why don't you take everything that's on this drive and put it on this drive? Which I can do. You can technically mirror all of your data on one drive on another, but that still gives you, there's, there's an issue with that. So even if one drive fails, and I, I still have this one, in order to you know, sleep at night, I'm gonna need to get another drive and then take the contents from this and put it on here. So you have this issue of like, when you're mirroring data on two drives, you only have one drive worth of protection. The other issue is that in order for me to mirror like five terabytes, I need to have another five terabyte drive. So basically, I'm spending all this money on drives, but I'm only getting 50% worth of capacity. So basically here, like let's, if these are both 10 terabyte drives and I'm using them to mirror one another, um, sorry, if these are both five terabyte drives and I'm using them to mirror, I'm only getting about, I'm only getting five terabytes worth of storage, even though I have 10 terabytes worth of combined or total storage across both drives. So it's, it's not the most efficient to just keep putting your data on these drives, at least for me, and the amount of data that I am dealing with. Um, like between filming shows and digitizing tapes and archiving tapes and then filming like stuff outside of shows, like that is a lot of data that I am going through. And I, I've already, I'm already at about 50 terabytes worth of video footage across however many years I've been doing this. And I'm already reaching the the limit with how much with storage I have in my current system. So that's why I'm building this new box, which we will get to. Um, so, okay. So in about 20, 2012, I bought this guy here. This is a Synology disk station. This is um, basically a storage array. And as you can see here, there are eight slots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, each of these has a hard drive in it. So I put a, I think I put, um, let's see, I can pop one out here, I'll show it to you. So let me switch to my overhead. So this is a uh, 10 terabyte uh, Western Digital uh, uh, red NAS drive. 
So there are different types of hard drives that you can use in a storage array. Um, I'm typically using um, red or enterprise gold drives because for, for a couple of reasons. Um, you don't want to just throw a random hard drive. You can. You can just throw a bunch of random hard drives in here. But when you have a bunch of hard drives running in close proximity with another, like again, here we have eight of these drives running all next to each other, uh, that creates a lot of heat and a lot of vibration. And unless you have a drive that is built to withstand both of those conditions, you will likely lead to a drive failure. So I typically use these red NAS drives because they are built for these sort of enclosures. And I also use enterprise drives because enterprise drives are built to work in large data centers and are able to withstand um, a lot of uh, vibration and heat as well. So basically, um, there are different types of RAID. So again, there is, like I said, RAID is a way of like distributing your data across multiple drives. So in that first example I was talking about, I was talking about mirroring. So technically, um, you can mirror your data in a RAID configuration. So it's basically taking all the data on here and mirroring it on here. So that is a very low level form of RAID. Uh, so there are, there's uh, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 5, RAID 6, and a bunch of other types of RAID. But um, so another type of RAID is called striping. So there's RAID mirroring, and then there's RAID striping. So what, sh what RAID striping does is that it literally takes half of your data, and it takes your data and splits it across both drives. So let's say I have a video, one video file. When you, if you mirror that, if you mirror it, in a RAID 0, it's going, to take that, it's going to take that video file and copy it to the other drive. So both drives contain the exact same video file. So that's RAID 0. RAID 1 does something a little different. It takes half of that video file and puts it on one drive and puts the other half on the other drive. So essentially, you're distributing, you're, you're distributing the, the actual file itself across two drives. That's technically not a RAID because even if, if, if one drive fails, you only have half the data and you're fucked. You can't recover that video file. So the reason why people might want to use that RAID configuration is because you'll, you'll technically get double the speed of the drive uh, and, I and, and double the space as well. Um, but again, you're not getting any sort of RAID protection in that situation. So um, in this configuration, in this Synology disk station that I, that I have. This is not a sponsored video, by the way. Um, I've, I've used this Synology. I've liked it. It's OK. I've had some problems with it. Uh, for an entry level person, this is probably fine. Um, and you can get smaller units as well. You don't, if you don't need all eight drives, you can get a smaller, I think they have a four bay unit. There's other brands as well. Um, but in this configuration, I'm running RAID 6. And RAID 6 allows up to two drives to fail. And you don't lose any of the data. So um, like I said, I have eight drives in here. Even if I lose two drives, if two drives die, I don't lose any of the data. As long as I replace the two dead drives with, a, with two new ones, then the surviving drives can repopulate the data that was lost on the dead drives. And I'll, I'll, and I'll explain this in a little bit, uh, but that's the beauty of RAID. RAID essentially distributes your data across, and depending on your RAID level, I should say, depending on your RAID level, RAID will distribute your data across multiple drives, and it also does something called parity. And what parity does is sort of like a uh, fault tolerance or sanity check that allows the, uh, allows the array to figure out it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's essentially like a, um, um, a safety check. So um, even if a drive dies or two drives die in your, configure, in your RAID array, the, the parity bits, again, bits, when you're dealing with computers and files, everything is a zero and one. These are bits. Uh, the parity bit in your array will allow the surviving drives to figure out what data was lost. So, we're going to talk about how parity works, a very, very basic bare bones example. 
Uh, it's going to go into a little bit of computer science, but it's, I think, uh, and you technically don't need to know how parity works to use a RAID array, but I think it will be instructive to uh, go through what it's doing just so you understand, like, have a deeper understanding of what's, what's going on. So um, let's see here. Um, yeah, uh, this is a very intense supermicro case. We'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, I just got this off eBay. We'll talk about all that stuff. Um, so let me, let me go into uh, my RAID discussion here. So, OK. So again, this is, this is, this is going to be the most computer science-y part of this live stream. And what I'm going to be doing here is explaining how uh, essentially parity works using Boolean operations. Again, this is a very basic example. Um, so there are different, different types of opera operations you can do on uh, binary uh, data. So again, binary is 0, 1. Everything on, your, everything on your computer is dealing with zeros and ones. So you have a not operation, which basically takes the, uh, the 0 bit and changes it to 1, or you uh, take a one bit and change it to a zero. So what a not operator does is it, it just flips the bit from zero to one or one to zero. And in um, computer science, zero is treated as false and one is treated as true. So you might hear that interchangeably, um, uh, zero and false, one and true. So what a not does, again, is if you have, uh, if your bit x is zero, a not will flip it to one. If your bit x is one, it'll flip it to zero. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, so da, 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 da. let's see here. A, what AND does, an AND operator takes two bits and it does a, uh, it, it combines them, basically saying if both bits are true, then the value of that AND gate is one. So uh, in all other situations, zero. So basically what AND says is that if x and y are both true, then the result is also true. So um, if you take the AND of two zero bits, you get a zero. If you take an AND of a zero and one, you get a zero. If you take an, if you take an AND of a one and zero, you get a zero. If you take an AND of a one and one, you get one. So again, what AND does is it takes both those bits and it spits out zero if, uh, sorry, it spits out one if both bits are one. It spits out zero in all of the situations. So that's what and is. Or is very similar, but hopefully by the name or you can figure out what it's doing. What or says is that if one, if at, if at least one of the bits is one, then your result of applying or is also one. So zero or zero is zero. Zero or one is one. One or zero is one. One or one is one. So um, again, all AND is saying is that at least one of the uh, two bits has to be true or one. In that case, the value is one. And if both uh, bits are zero, then the value of the OR gate is zero. So those are the three basic ones you'll see, a NOT, AND, and OR. And, um, the, the, the next one is a little bit more confusing, but this is the crux of how parity works. Um, it's called exclusive OR or XOR. Um, there's a echo. Okay, hold on. Um, okay, I know why there's an echo. Let me turn that off real quick. Uh, um, okay, the... Um, Hopefully you can still hear me. I think the echo is off now. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see here. All right. Um, da, 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 da. Echo is gone. Okay, good. All right, so you, uh, you want me to repeat something? Okay. Um, let me know what you want me to repeat. Basically, what exclusive OR is doing 
is it is saying that at most one of the bits, if at most one of the bits is one, then you get a one. In all of, in all of the situations, you get a zero. So exclusive or is different from or in the sense that if both bits are true, exclusive or gives you a zero. Um, think about it. I mean, it, it's called exclusive or because it means it's, ex it's exclusively saying that only one of the bits can be true and um, in order for it to be true. So if we look at this here, um, it's, it's the same as or, except in the situation where both bits are one. In that situation, we, we get a zero. So it's a little confusing, but once you commit it to memory that that's how exclusive or works, you're good to go. I remember when I first learned exclusive or in high school, I did not understand it at all. And then I just like did a bunch of like, uh, we had a bunch of exercises that we had to do, basically combining uh, logical gates and, 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 and reducing them. And to finally click, like, okay, this is why it's, it's saying this. Um, so let's say, I'm trying to figure out how to transition from this to, to RAID. So here's, okay, here's, here's, how, I'll, here's how I'm going to do it. So, um, Let's say let's go to let's go back to the AND gate and again. Let's say our our video file is represented by the bits x and y. So our video file that we're saving on a hard drive is just two bits. It's going to be zero 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 one one zero or one one. Now, if I'm just, if I'm saving this this video file on a RAID array, I could put bit on one drive the second bit on another drive. Again, that's called striping. So I'm literally just, I'm just taking the first bit, putting it on one drive, taking the second bit, putting it on the other drive. Um, again, in that situation, if one drive dies, you, don't, you can't recover the, the data, the, the, the missing data. But let's say you have three drives. So you have uh, three drives of the same size, and you are, and we want to stripe the data. We're striping the we're striping the the two bits across two drives, and on the third drive, we're going to put the a parity bit. This again, this is an oversimplification. Um, if you want to learn about how RAID works, there are 100,000 other better tutorials than this. Um, but again, this is just a very basic, as basic as I can make it, introduction into what RAID is doing. So let's say on the first drive, we're storing the X bit. And the second drive, we're storing the Y bit, and on the third drive, we're going to start. We're going to we're going to store the the parity bit. So uh, in this case, we're going to say the parity bit is um, is just the result of the logical operator. So again, um, let's see. Let's go to front here. X, Y, and then the logical operator goes onto the third drive. So here we go. So in the situation where we have, uh, the, in the first case, we're going to look at this first row of and, which is x and y are 0. Um, so it's going to store 0, 0, 0. And uh, in the case of um, 0 and 1, uh, it's going to store 0, 1, 0. The third case, 1, 0, 0. And then the final case, 1, 1, 1. Now, let's say this first drive dies. So all we have is the value of the y bit and the value of the logical operator and that combined this drive or the bits on this drive, the bits on this drive, and put it on its, the, the third drive. Now, in the, in, in, in the case where, again, this drive dies, we only have the y bit and then the and, the resulting and. So if you look at the table, and again, pretend like we can't even see the x column. So all we have is y and f here. Now, if we're trying to recover the data, you can actually you, you see that we're going to run into an issue because if we know if we know that um, if we know that the the parity bit on this drive is one, then we know by definition of and that the data on both these drives must also be one. 
So in that situation, we're fine. But if we know that um, if the value on the if, the if the value of the parity bit on this drive is zero, we actually don't know. Um, and, and sorry, and we do know that this is zero. The 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 y bit is zero. We actually don't know whether the uh, the bit on the dead drive was one or zero. So if you look at the table, the first row and the uh, third row of the and uh, the and um, gate explain explain what I'm saying here. So again, in the situation where the result the resulting parity bit is zero on the the parity drive, we we cannot recover. And, and, and sorry, and we know that the value of the y bit on the other drive is zero. We cannot recover whether or not the the bit on the dead drive was zero or one, because again, zero and zero is uh, sorry. Um, yeah, zero and zero is zero. Zero and one is zero. One and zero is zero in terms of the and operator. So and is not a good way of storing a parity bit because it is not allowing you to recover. Um, it's, it's, it's not allowing you to do the inverse operation to figure out, OK, I have the result. Let me, let me, let me work backwards to figure out what the missing data was. You have a, you have a similar is issue with the or operator um, because in the case of um, or, You'll have you'll have the similar issue where it is even if you know the parity bit, even if you know the resulting uh, bitwise operation from the two x y bits, and one of the drives dies, you're not going to be able to figure out what was on that dead drive. Um, but if you look at the exclusive OR, exclusive OR actually might help us here. So in the situation, okay, again, we don't know what's on this drive now. If the parity bit is zero, again in the table, look at the F column. We're looking at we're looking at the uh, the far right column, the XOR table, and we're looking at the uh, F column. Um, if the parity bit is zero and the Y bit is zero, we know that by definition of exclusive OR that the, the bit on the dead drive must also be zero. So in that case, we're able to recover that first, uh, that fir that first, the first scenario where it's zero and zero. We know that the dead drive must also include zero. So let's look at the second example where we know that the parity bit is one. We know that the Y bit is one. And by definition of exclusive or, only one of X and Y can be one in order for the parity bit to be one. So because we know that the parity bit is one, and we know that the y bit is also one, that means by definition, the value on the dead drive must also must be zero. So both those first two cases are 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 good. Now um, the third case where we know that the parity bit is one. This is this is the the flip side. We know that the parity bit is one. We know that the y bit is zero. By definition, the other case, the, the dead drive must be one. Now, um, if the parity bit is zero, um, if the parity bit is uh, zero, and we know that the y bit is one, we know by definition of exclusive or exclusive or is different from or because in exclusive or both the bits cannot be one. Only at most one of them can be one. So in the case where the uh, parity bit is zero and the y bit is one. We know that the only scenario where that can occur is if the uh, x bit is also one. So as you can see, exclusive or in this situation is allowing us to recover the missing data on a dead drive. And it doesn't have to be the parity bit. So even, even if, if the parity bit survives and the x bit survives, sorry, the parity drive and the x drive survives, even if the Y drive dies, we can still apply the same logic in inverting the exclusive OR to figure out what was on the, the missing dead Y drive. So that's the beauty of exclusive OR. So if we go to, um, 
this example. This is showing you what's actually happening on a much larger, slightly larger scale. Um, so what exclusive or is doing, so let's say you have on your drive, on your disk one, this string of ones and zeros. Again, this is corresponding to uh, a file in your, in your system. So what's stored on disk one is one zero zero one zero one zero zero. Disk two is uh, storing one one zero one zero zero one zero. If you apply bitwise exclusive or on these, uh, on these, on these two uh, bit sequences, what you get here, I'll, I'll just walk you through it so you can see it. Zero and zero exclusive or zero is zero. I'm going from, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm basically going from right to left here. Um, zero exclusive or zero is zero. Zero exclusive or one is one. One exclusive or zero is one. Zero x or zero is zero. One exclusive one is zero, and so on and so forth. So again, what that, what essentially exclusive or does, it allows you to, it's allowing you to combine your information in such a way that even if you lose some information, you're able to recover what was lost. Now, um, in RAID systems, it's actually a little bit, it's, it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially what is happening is you are distributing your data across multiple drives and you're also storing a parity bit, and your parity bit is typically an exclusive, something like an exclusive OR that is, a, again, a sanity check that allows the system to figure out, okay, given all of these drives, we're able to figure out what, even if a drive dies or two drives die, we can pool our information together to recover that missing data. So that's, to, that is basically how RAID systems work, is you're storing a parity bit across your drives. So what that means is, um, again, I have, eight, I have uh, eight 10 terabyte drives in this, uh, I have eight 10 terabyte drives in this storage array. So I technically don't have 80 terabytes worth of storage because I'm storing, uh, or the, I'm not, I'm saying I, but the RAID, the RAID controller is doing all this. I don't have to, I'm not doing anything by hand. The RAID controller, there's RAID in here, that is basically storing the parity bit across the drive. So if you think about it, you're, you're losing some of your drive capacity to store that sanity check, that parity bit is being stored. Those parity bits are being stored on your storage array. So again, that's why you're not gonna get the full 80 terabytes because that the, that's the trade-off is you know in order in order to in order to have data redundancy you're going to have to sacrifice some storage capacity because that extra storage capacity that you're losing is being used to store the uh, the parity bits so that's what raid does is you're, there's a trade-off that you have to give here in terms of how much are you willing to sacrifice in order to give you some peace of mind in terms of redundancy so um, that is essentially, um, that is the, that's the most technical part of this conversation. So if, if you, if you zoned out, if you fell asleep, that's fine. Um, cause we're going to, we're going to move forward and talk about the actual RAID system that I built and we're going to, we're going to build out today. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, Otherwise, I'm just going to start getting this stuff ready. So I'll, I'll talk about the hardware in this RAID system in a second. Um, let's just, uh, so again, again, if, you, if you're just starting out, like these are fine. Like you can use these like external drives, but just be aware that it's going to be a headache. As you get more data, scaling this up is not going to be great because you're going to have to buy, you're going to have to keep buying more of these drives you're not going to be able to easily mount them as one single drive as you can do with one of these solutions. These solutions allow you, like when you're running a RAID volume, you can access that RAID volume as if it's one single drive. So even though, again, I have eight, I have eight 10 terabyte drives in here, it's not 80 terabytes, it's about 60 terabytes, and the remaining 20 terabytes are used for parity. Um, I'm able to use this as a networked 
attached storage device. So if I have like, um, if I want to access, if, if some of you have probably heard of like a Plex server or something like that, if you want to put uh, video files on your server and access those video files on your TV or what have you, or access them across other computers in your network, you would use something like a NAS. Um, and so the beauty of running a, a RAID NAS is that when I connect to this, all I see, I see one single volume that is 60 terabytes, even though it is eight individual hard drives working together. So that's the beauty of running something like this as opposed to running a bunch of external drives is you can access it as if it's one single drive uh, on top of having your, your protection from uh, having redundancy. Um, you can also use cloud storage, um, whether it's Amazon, uh, Microsoft, or Google. You can store your data on the cloud. Um, I don't do that because I have way too much data. Again, I have about 50 terabytes worth of video footage, and storing that on the cloud is not cheap. Uh, I've ran the numbers, and basically what I would spend per year hosting 50 terabytes worth of footage on the cloud is essentially what I spend every couple years on building a storage array. So I've spent, I forget the total, I've spent probably $2,000, over $2,000 on this new array. Um, the previous array, I think, is probably closer to $4,000. But that's, that's a one-time cost every three years at this point. Basically, basically, every three to four years, I'm building or upgrading my storage array. And last time I did the calculations, in, it, in order for me to host that amount of data on the cloud, I'd be spending at least a couple grand per year. So for me, it doesn't make sense. If you have less data, so a, the average person has way less data than I do. So I would recommend for most people, like you can get away with storing on the cloud. Um, you don't need, to, you technically don't need to worry about RAID because they do all that on the back end. Um, they are acting as your redundant and your, your backup solution. But technically not a backup as well because like, I'm sure some of you saw that news article that MySpace lost like 500 million songs or whatever it was. Basically every song that was ever uploaded to MySpace, they lost. So there's no guarantee that even if you have your data hosted somewhere, that it's protected. So that's why you know, Google, Amazon, you're probably pretty safe. But in the event of a catastrophic, catastrophic failure, worst case scenario, doomsday scenario, something, something could happen, that data might not be recoverable. And I don't want to trust my data in the hands of another company. So that's another reason why I maintain my own servers is because I have full control over um, maintaining the server, making sure everything is there, and upgrading it and all that stuff. So the, I don't expect the average person, the average person probably will not build a storage array, but the options are there, like cloud storage, if you don't want to have to do a build on your own. Um, so do I do backups as well? Um, yes. So essentially what I do is this Synology technically lives at my mom's house. So uh, my mom lives in New Jersey. My parents live in New Jersey. Uh, I leave this at my mom's house, this 60 terabyte Synology, di Synology disk station. I leave this at their house. This is running RAID 6. RAID 6 allows up to two drives to fail, I think. Uh, I think it's six. Um, kind of blanking at the moment. Um, and what happens is my storage array in where I, where, uh, this, this array is going to, this, this, this big one's going to live here with me. Basically every, every night, this, um, this server is gonna send any new data that was added on here to this, to this offsite backup. So this Synology technically is my offsite backup. It is a RAID 6 array that is a mirror of everything that is on here. And what we're, what we're gonna put on this guy is a RAID Z3. RAID Z3 is essentially allowing up to three drives to fail. And it's called Z because I'm running, uh, I'm running FreeNAS. Uh, FreeNAS is a uh, open source um, software solution that does software RAID. So there's, there's hardware RAID and there's software RAID. We'll go into a little bit of that. Probably not going to go into too much detail, but 
Uh, FreeNAS is an open source free software RAID uh, management uh, system that you can use that's built on top of FreeBSD, which is like a Unix-like uh, operating system. FreeBSD is free. Uh, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna install FreeNAS. We're gonna download it, install it onto this machine. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, this is my technically my off-site backup. So I have my redundant, my redundancy locally on this server that is allowing me to lose up to three drives. And then I have my off-site backup, which is also a redundant solution for the off-site backup location. So it, this is completely overkill. Um, I did not use this as a backup for a while. And then about last year, I was like, you know what? I have all of my data on here, which is great. I have redundancy, but as I said, at the very beginning of the stream, redundancy is not a backup, and that's why um, I use an offsite backup. Again, I, I suspect if, if you're doing a lot of archival work or have a lot of very important data and you don't want to store it on the cloud, like you should look into having a RAID and a offsite backup. Again, this is overkill because um, you can do that stuff with a, a cloud storage solution, but I am uh, a maniac and like maintaining my own server, so that's why I keep this one off-site. Um, so, like I said, um, what's up, Max Hart? Thanks for tuning in. Um, how many terabytes are going into this? So, um, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is I have, let's see, I'll pop this open here. So I have, I have these four terabyte uh, Western Digital um, Enterprise Gold drives. So these are like, uh, these are um, these SATA drives, six gig gigabits per second, um, enterprise rated. So they are rated to run, rated, R-A-T-E-D, not RAID, but rated, as in like they are uh, tested and approved to run in a like high capacity storage unit. Uh, because again, if you're just tuning in, one of the issues that you need to be mindful of when you're running a array is the temperature and the vibrations. Because when you're running a bunch of drives together, it's gonna get hot, there's gonna be a lot of vibrations because these things are all spinning up. So you need drives that are able to withstand both those conditions. So basically the short answer to answer your question is we're gonna build a, I have, I have 12 of these drives, I have 12 four terabyte drives uh, in these 12 slots, basically these, these top this, these first two rows are uh, four terabyte drives. These are empty slots right now. So there's nothing in these two rows, sorry, these two columns. Um, that's the short answer is we're gonna build a one volume uh, Z3, uh, RAID Z3 uh, volume using these 12 four terabyte drives. It's gonna give us about 30 terabytes worth of usable storage. And again, we're not getting the full uh, 48 terabytes because we're using some of that storage capacity for um, data redundancy. Um, the other thing is, let me switch over to this handheld camera here. So we also have uh, 12 more slots back here. So we have the, we have the, um, we have the 24, um, we have the 24 slots in the front and then in the back, the rear, we have uh, another 12. So again, this is the same thing. There's nothing in here right now, but we will, uh, I will eventually put some drives in here. So I hope that answers your question about how much we're putting in here. Um, yeah, so you have the reds. You, if you're running the reds in your NAS, the golds are more expensive. I can't remember how much more. Um, Basically, I just got these 12 drives for about like, I wanna say like about 175 each. I wanna say that's roughly what I spent. Um, it was between 160 and 180, uh, roughly 175 per, uh, per drive for these four terabyte enterprise golds. Um, so this is, again, this is the new system we're gonna build. It's technically 36 bays. They're each, these, these are called bays, uh, 36 slots for the drives. I have a 24, uh, 24 uh, bay array that I've been using since about 2015. So I'll show that to you now real quick so you can actually see. Now the, I actually, so this is my, my 3D printer here. Um, but I have the, my existing RAID is in a, um, 
soundproof enclosure. So if I open this up and I pull this out here, it's a little dusty, so that means I gotta, <laughs> I'm overdue for cleaning this thing. But as you can see here, hopefully you can see this. Let me bump up my ISO so you can see a little brighter here. Okay, so there, there are 24 of these bays. Each of these bays has a drive in it, so I can, I'll, no, I'm not gonna pop one out. But basically, um, these, uh, these 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 12, uh, these 16 have uh, four terabyte drives running in a RAID Z3 configuration. And then I have in these slots here, let's see. in these slots I have uh, these Western Digital three terabyte uh, red NAS drives. So as you can see, it's all blinking. If you, let's see, hopefully you can see these lights blinking. What's happening is that the RAID controller, because I popped the drive out, the RAID controller thinks that one of the drives died. So what it's doing is it's saying, oh shit, one of the drives died. It's basically checking the parity. Um, it's, it's more or less working to check the parity. It's working to figure out, hey, what data was just lost? And it's getting ready to prepare um, a, a potential rebuild, basically. So if multiple drives, again, if, if I take out multiple of these drives, the system is gonna start to panic and it's gonna say, hey, we just lost a bunch of data. Let's start figuring out what is lost and we'll, we'll rebuild it. So again, I have the, uh, I have 12, sorry, I have uh, 16 four terabyte drives and then I have another eight three terabyte drives. And this is a 24 bay array. Um, there's no, uh, there are no 12 slots on the rear. So let me put this back in here. We'll close that up. And then we'll just switch back to the front. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Um, let's see, okay. Um, yeah, I'm having anxiety thinking about what happens right now that he has all the backups in one space. Yes, I have a lot of anxiety too. Basically, once this storage system is built, I'm gonna take my Synology, I'm gonna move this back to my mom's house, and then I will have my offsite backup. Um, um, how long does equipment last before you need to look at replacing? So this, both the, both the system I just showed you and the one that we're gonna build, these are basically enterprise grade storage systems that are used in massive data centers. So these things are, these things are built to like run for a long time in really intense conditions. And I'm just a home user, I'm not running like, I'm not doing, I'm basically storing my data on here and I leave it on here. I'm not doing a lot of read, write, con, like con, uh, concurrent read, write access. I'm basically, like I come home, I, after I film a show, I come home, I dump my memory cards, I put it on here and then um, I might pull the data off here to edit it and then that's it. So I'm not doing a lot of reading and writing. It's basically just storing. So this hardware, knock on wood, I don't have wood here, but knock on wood, this stuff lasts quite a while because these are built to run in like industrial settings. Um, the Synology, again, I've had this since 2012. I had one issue where it like powered off and it wouldn't power on. And I like, I had to keep pressing the reboot button and finally it turned back on. And I, I've read that there are, at least with this model, there were some power, there were issues with the power supply. I think they've resolved it with a uh, recall or you can send it in for repair, but these solutions will last you a good while, not as long as something like this, but if you go on YouTube, you'll see plenty of people who talk about how their Synologies have died after a couple of years or what have you. But like, again, I have not had catastrophic issues with my Synology. Um, two Drobos. Yeah, I thought about getting a Drobo. Before, I considered a Drobo before I went with Synology. Um, one of the issues that I had with Drobo, and maybe they've changed it, when I first looked at Drobo in 2012, the reason I did not go with a Drobo was because they used a proprietary RAID solution. So again, we talked about RAID 0, RAID 1. Again, I'm running RAID uh, 6 in here. We're gonna run RAID Z3 in here. There are proprietary RAID solutions that companies like Drobo and Synology, they also they have their own version of RAID, but it's, it's proprietary, meaning that if, if you're, 
if the unit die, if the drives survive, but let's say the motherboard or the RAID controller dies, you technically need to buy the exact, you have to buy hardware from the company in order for you to recover that missing, or basically recover the data that was on those drives. They may, again, they may have changed that, but that's the reason why I did, I did not go with a Drobo because I was really concerned about relying on proprietary software because for me, the other issue is what happens if Drobo or Synology, the company goes under and I'm not able to buy those parts. Whereas the other benefit for running like an open source DIY solution, if you're willing to deal with the headaches of like managing it, is you have the freedom to like swap out parts and you are able to, I, I personally find it, to be much easier to, to recover or deal with, with failure. So technically, technically if, this, if, if the hardware in this dies, just goes to, like shits the bed tonight, and I just take out these drives, I could pop them into another, uh, uh, another unit running FreeNAS, and I can import that data and I'm, and I'm good to go. So that's um, one of the reasons why um, I'm running this. Do I use um, EMP devices to protect from searches? No, I don't. I do want to get like a universal or a UPS, a you know backup power supply unit, but I don't. I haven't done that one. Haven't done that yet. Um, that is the next step. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to say here. Um, at, later on in the stream, I'm going to turn this on. It's going to get really loud. As you'll see in a minute, there are a lot of fans in here that run to keep this thing cool. Um, I'm, I'm running a, I have a soundproof enclosure for my current um, array. So that's running inside. It's, it's much more the, you can still hear a little bit of the hum. Probably, you probably can't hear it on the stream, but I can hear it um, just day to day. But it's in the soundproof enclosure, which helps like isolate that sound pretty well. Um, okay, so. Is there anything else I wanted to say before we do the actual build? Any other quick questions before we do this? Um, all right, so I'll talk about what's in here. Um, let's switch over to, let's go to the overhead. Everyone wants to see what's inside. So we'll open it up and then let's move this forward so you can actually see it a little bit more. So quickly, I'm gonna just show you what um, what's in here. So, okay, so I bought this, again, I got this off eBay. So again, um, what's, what's cool is there are plenty of eBay sellers that are selling, they basically pull these units out of a data center. I don't know what data centers, but like data centers are constantly upgrading their equipment. They sell these off. These eBay sellers get their hands on them, they test them, and then they resell them at a fairly reasonable price. So I bought all of this minus the hard drives. I got the, the enclosure, the motherboard, the RAM, the uh, CPU, the fans, the power supply. I basically got everything in here except the hard drives, except for the RAID controller for about 600 bucks. I think I got it for like 590. I think it says up here what I paid. No, it doesn't say what I paid, but it was, it was, like, it was like 490 and then $80 in shipping, and then whatever taxes was, I can't remember. But essentially for five to 600 bucks, I got the entire enclosure, the uh, motherboard, the CPUs, uh, the RAM, uh, fans, power supply, and all I had to do was buy the drives and the RAID controller, which I will talk about that in a second. Um, Yeah, so right, so it's it's much cheaper. It's definitely much cheaper than a Synology, but again, you have to, in, in both cases, you still have to factor in uh, buying the drives, but this is much louder. Like the, the, there, there are a lot of benefits from running a Synology. The Synology units are smaller form factor, they're quieter. Um, so it, if you don't mind like managing your own unit, or you have, like you can throw this in your basement where, you don't, where you're not worried about sound, like you will save money building your own. Um, but again, that's just how I look at it. A lot of people might say, 
I'm, I'm sure there are cheaper units now, but I still think for the most part it is cheaper to build your own. So spec wise, what do we got in here? So we have a, there are two Intel Xeon E5-2643, 3.3 gigahertz, four cores. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, eight core drives, sorry, eight core CPUs in here. Um, so technically there are, uh, that's per CPU, so there are 16 cores total. Um, in this unit, let me just show you, switch to the overhead. I'm gonna take this off. This is just a, uh, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. This is just a, a uh, it's redirect, it's constant, this is, this is basically concentrating the airflow because again, uh, again, with these systems, you're, you're, you have to be mindful of the temperature. So the fans are basically blowing the hot air, uh, the hot air from the drives is being blown out through the fans and then it's coming out or coming through, uh, this, it's basically, it's a conduit that basically funnels all the air through this system and then out the, out the rear of the chassis. So again, here are the two uh, CPUs. Again, these are the Xeons uh, that are running in here. Um, da, 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 da. Right, so let me switch back to the PIP. Um, so we're running 64 gigs of uh, DDR3. Uh, these should be ECC RAM. Technically, you want, uh, from what I've read, uh, you need uh, error correcting code RAM, ECC RAM, because again, when you have drives fail in your uh, in a RAID configuration, when drives fail, the system is going to start figuring out, hey, this drive died, what data is missing? Let's let's repopulate it. So again, like when I was just over when I when I just showed you my other system, I pulled out that drive, all the lights started blinking. If I put a brand new drive in there it would start rebuilding. And rebuilding is basically the, this, the, is what happens. Rebuilding is um, the uh, scenario where the surviving drives work together with the RAID controller to figure out, hey, a drive just died, let's work together to figure out what data was missing, and then let's repopulate that data on that missing drive, or that, that new drive that replaced the dead drive. So that's what, that was starting to happen when I pulled out that drive. The RAID system was figuring out, hey, we just lost some data. Let's figure out, figure out what happened. But you want error correcting code RAM from what I've read because ECC RAM is, uh, it has a better fault tolerance in terms of in situations where you're, when you're trying to figure out, hey, we're missing some bits, you want the error correcting, the error correcting codes have a lower, I think, error rate in terms of um, recovering uh, data, essentially. I'm not, I don't know much about ECC RAM, but I think that's, the general gist. Maybe someone in the chat can tell, can talk a little bit more about ECC RAM. Uh, what I do know is that uh, in RAID systems, the general rule, the general rule of thumb is that you want about one gigabyte for every terabyte worth of storage. You want one gigabyte of RAM. So again, we are building about a 30 ter in this in this first demo. We're going to build a 30 terabyte uh, RAID array. So we we'd want 32 terabyte storage. 32 gigs of RAM in the system. So this came with 64 gigs of RAM. So this should allow me to safely build out a roughly 60-ish uh, terabyte RAID array. There are still plenty of uh, RAM slots left in here. So again, we have, um, there are um, four RAM chips, uh, four RAM uh, DIMMs per, per CPU. And there's a total of, I think, it, I think they're eight each. So eight, uh, eight, 16, 24, 30, yeah. So we have um, each CPU is, has about uh, has 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, and again, there's two, so a total of 64. But there are still a bunch of open uh, RAM slots. So if I needed to, if I needed to uh, expand this, I can. But again, this, is gonna, this should have me covered for at least up to a roughly 60 terabytes worth of um, uh, storage. So that is uh, the RAM. What else do we got here? Um, this has two, okay, someone's asking about power. This comes with two uh, 1280 watt power supplies. So let me switch over to this camera and I'll show you here. So these are the two power supply units. And so what's cool about these is these are, I can actually just like pull these out. So this is, 
one power supply. And here's the second one. So you can see here just a super micro um, PWS 1K28P power supply. And that's basically it. Um, again, these just slide out. Um, I think these are redundant power supplies, meaning that if one dies, as long as the other one is still plugged in, it should still supply power to the system. I think, I think, I'm not entirely sure because uh, I'm running two backplanes. I'll talk about what backplanes are next, but basically I have two backplanes because again, I have the 12, I have the 24 uh, bays in the front and 12 in the back. So there are technically two uh, backplanes in here, one with 24 slots, one with 12. I'm not entirely sure if I need both of these power supplies in order to power both backplanes or if these are just acting as a fail, fail safe. I, I might need to check the manual on that, but again, these just are, um, these are in here. Um, my other, my other uh, free NAS box, the one with 24 bays, that, that only has one power supply. So I do want to figure out because um, doubling the power is going gonna, is gonna to do a number on my electricity bill already. So um, I'm going to slide these back in here real quick. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to show you a cool thing that I noticed about this. So um, should not be hot swappable. Oh, should be hot swappable, can remove unless it's overloaded. Interesting, okay, well thank you for that. I wanted, I needed someone to verify that that was the case because I wasn't entirely sure. Um, so the other, the other interesting thing about this case is that these fans are, it's a very modular design. So yeah, I can basically just like pop the fans out if I need to replace them or what have you. So these are the fans that, that are provided by Supermicro. So um, Again, this is a super micro chassis, super micro motherboard. Super micro is known for building these like enterprise business grade servers. So they basically, uh, they, they ship with these uh, fans. These are very loud, but again, in a system where we have upwards of 36 hard drives running concurrently, we need to be mindful about uh, temperature and airflow. So some people, if you go on YouTube, you'll find that some people like replace these with quieter fans which you can do, and, it, and, um, and maybe it's safe, but there's a reason why Supermicro uses these loudest fans because it's, 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 uh, it's able to push enough air at a fast enough rate through the system. And I don't know if the quieter fans that you can buy at like a computer store are gonna be fast enough or reliable enough to do that. So that's something I wanna look into because this is this, when, when I power this up, it's gonna get really loud. It sounds like a fucking jet engine, just like, just like spinning up. So um, I could probably control the fan speed either in the BIOS or within FreeNAS, but um, again, that's something I need to look into. So let's switch back over to the overhead. Um, not cheap, but the super expensive. Okay, um, so we'll pop these back in here. Well, before I do that, I'll show you the um, so what's cool about this, and I, I didn't know this until uh, like a week ago. So again, there's, more, there's a bunch of shit, not a bunch of it, but there is shit under this, um, under this case here. So again, this is the side. Um, again, the, the motherboard is basically going down here. In order for me to access the back plane, the rear back plane, I was like, I was confused because I was like, how can I access it? Because it's, it's covered by this drive. And then I, I looked at the manual and the manual for this chassis says that you can slide this out. And I was like, how the fuck do I do that? So word, word to the wise here. When in doubt, read the manual. Um, I think manuals get a ton of flack for being unnecessary. And who, you know, who reads the manual when you buy some new equipment? But in cert certain situations like this, having a manual is actually uh, helpful. So what's cool here is if, it, if, I slide, if I pop this out, so this actually slides. This slides out and I don't, have to, I don't have to disconnect anything. So let me just move this up here so you can see it. So um, I'm able to now, if I want to, I can access the, the back plane. So the rear, let's see, that is, this is the rear back plane back here. Um, I can actually ac I can access it now. Now that I've slid the the, the entire chassis out, um, 
for my boot drive um, in, my, in my existing FreeNAS box, I'm basically running the OS, I'm running FreeNAS on a uh, thumb drive, just like a, I have like a 64 terabyte thumb drive. And I have that basically thumb drive um, plugged into the uh, uh, internal USB port on the, um, on the motherboard. People, if you, if you look at the free NAS forums, if you look at like, um, any forums about um, building your own NAS, like a lot of people recommend just using a thumb drive because you're not doing, the OS isn't doing much. Again, all this box is doing is just running a software RAID and that is basically keeping the drives happy. So you're not doing a lot of, there's not a lot of like intense OS operations needed. So you technically don't need a fast, like spinning hard drive or even like an SSD running the OS. Um, um, yeah, sorry, not 64 terabytes, 64 gig thumb drive in that other array. But again, so uh, when I, I, I actually installed FreeNAS on this a couple of days ago as a test run for the stream. And I, I, I was using this uh, PNY 16 gig, sorry, 32 gig uh, thumb drive as the boot drive. And FreeNAS installed, but there was an issue where like during the boot sequence, like the middleware wasn't running. And then it was such a slow boot up. It was taking like 15, 20 minutes just to boot up. And I said, you know what, fuck this. So I got rid of the, the thumb drive. And then I found a little, like, um, I had an extra 2.5 inch, um, let's switch over here, you can see it. I had an extra 2.5 inch, uh, 250 gig um, spinning hard drive. Like this is for like a laptop or whatever. Um, this actually came with the box and I, I didn't know, I didn't realize why. I was like, why did this come with it? And then uh, I realized, oh, I can actually just install the OS on here. So I mounted it underneath here. When it first came, it was actually occupying one of these slots. But again, I want to use these slots for my, my actual RAID. Um, so I basically mounted this um, 2.5 inch serial AT, SATA drive to the bottom of the, the chassis here. And all that is doing, that's running the OS and it is much faster now. Um, as you'll see, it's much faster to, like, to boot this up. Um, so next we're gonna talk about backplanes. So how do I explain, explain backplanes? Um, I'll show you what a backplane is. Um, so this is a backplane. Now there is, again, there's a backplane in the uh, front here. Again, let me switch to the, you can see it here. There is a backplane, this whole thing back here is, <laughs> is a backplane. And again, I showed you there's a backplane for the reverse side. And what the backplane does is, so now we're gonna start reaching my limits of knowledge <laughs> on this stuff because I was like racking my brain trying to figure out how this stuff works. But essentially what the backplane does is it allows you to connect multiple drives. So in this case, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, 12, 18, 24. Each of these, each of these black, um, black things is a SATA port and SATA is what allows you to, is the port that a hard drive uses. So if you go to the front here, again, each of these, you know, we would have a hard drive in here. Well, I can just show you here. So we have, Right, so the hard drive sits in this caddy. This is a SATA port in the back, right? And then internally here, uh, this slides in and it connects to the back plane. It connects to one of these uh, black slots, which is the SATA port. So what the back plane allows you to do is it allows you to connect multiple drives to one, essentially one interface. And so I don't have to, basically I don't have to run 24 cables to plug in each drive. All 24 drives on the front back lane, uh, on, the front, on the front side are, are plugged into the back lane. And then um, here's where things get a little, little weird. So uh, you can see here, um, this cable here is, let's see, focus that. This is um, the SAS port. So there's a, a primary, uh, there's actually three primary SAS ports, one, two, and three. This, is, this back plane is a, uh, BPN SAS2 E46EL-1, I think. Let me check here. Yeah, here we go. So the, the back planes, we have, we have the BPN SAS2. Uh, there's different SAS. There's SAS, SAS, SAS2, SAS3. This is a SAS2. 
E46 EL124 port, six gigabits per second, single expander backplane. Um, and the rear is a 12 port uh, six, uh, SAS2 uh, expander. So what the ex from what I've gathered, and I'm still learning about this, but basically what the expander does, it allows you to plug in, um, and so we'll talk about this next. This is, this is the RAID controller. Uh, it allows you to uh, plug in, uh, take one, essentially one cable, uh, and plug that into the, uh, allows you to plug it into the backplane. And so this is a, again, this is called a, uh, in the description, it's, it's a single port expander. So basically, this one port will expand connectivity to all 24 drives in the backplane. Um, I'm not sure, and maybe someone can tell me, this is something I still need to figure out, but again, uh, I just showed you that there are three SAS ports on the backplane. I don't know if I can plug in, so in the, um, in the uh, RAID controller, there are four of these uh, SAS connections. I don't know if I could plug, if I plug in a second one to uh, the second SAS in the backplane, I don't know if that's going to improve my throughput or not, because again, the, the, the manual says that this is a single port expander, so I don't know if I can like double my throughput uh, by doubling the lanes. So each of these SAS, uh, SAS connections supports, I think, four lanes. Uh, so I don't know if I can get, I don't know if I can get uh, eight lanes out of it by, by doubling the cables, but we're, that's something I, I gotta figure out. Um, now, switch back here. You'll see that there is a second cable here. So this first, sorry, this first one is going, this first one here is going to the, the, uh, the RAID controller. And then there's a second one here. So what this is doing, this is allowing me to cascade both backplanes. So this, this cable here, it runs from here, goes underneath here, and it connects to the rear backplane. So what that does, and this is something that I, I just learned, is it allows you to um, more or less daisy chain mold to a backplane. So again, there are 24 um, SATA slots on the front. There are 12 SATA slots in the back. By cascading them, the RAID controller can see it as one single 36 bay unit. And so I think that is the, um, the benefit of cascading. Now, the other cool thing about this is um, from this rear backplane, I can cascade this to another backplane. So when eventually I max this system out, I don't know when that'll happen, but at some point I'm gonna run out of space on this, I'm gonna be able to cascade from the rear backplane into my other existing uh, FreeNAS box, which has another 24 slots. So basically what my long-term, what my short-term plan is, is I'm gonna, we're gonna create the um, 30 terabyte uh, RAID Z3 volume with the 12 drives in here. And then um, sometime in the next week or two, I'm basically gonna, I'm gonna take the data off the other um, RAID array. And so that, this box here, like I said, this box that I have back here has two volumes. The first volume is 40, it, it's the uh, 16 four terabyte drives running in Z3, and that's 40 terabytes, so that's one volume. When I say volume, I mean like my computer thinks it's one hard drive. So it's one, it's one volume of 40 terabytes. I have another volume of 10 terabytes that is a, um, those are the eight three terabytes, eight three terabyte drives running at RAID Z2. Um, those form a 10 terabyte volume. So my plan is, is I'm gonna build out the 30 terabyte volume RAID Z3 in this new drive, in this new, new system. I'm going to move the 10 terabytes from the volume two on the old array to here. So that will leave, that will leave, um, 20 terabytes free on this system. And then I'm gonna move the 40 terabytes, the 40 terabyte, the 40 terabyte volume is already full. It's already maxed out, I can't add anything to it, but I'm basically gonna move that from there to here, just so it's all in one enclosed system. So this is technically, uh, when, I, when I'm done after next week, this is gonna have 70 terabytes. So it's gonna have 30, it's gonna have the, uh, the 40 that I move over, which is already full, 
it's going to have the 30 that I'm adding today. So that's 70, but it's going to be 70 total. But again, 40 is already used from the first volume. I'm going to, I'm going to from the start, already use up 10 from, this, from the uh, data that I'm migrating over. So technically, I'm only going to have 20 terabytes. I'm going to have 20 terabytes across this. But uh, that's going to be, uh, again, there's 12 drives here, 16 drives from the old array. So that's 28 drives there. I'm going to have another eight drives free in the back. So that is going to allow me to have another um, 18 terabytes, I think, roughly, of storage down the road. So once I max out of the, 10 ter the, the remaining 20 terabytes on this array, I'm going to add more drives to the back. And then that'll be extended out. Now, technically, I can buy bigger drives. You can, again, I'm running four terabyte drives. You can buy, like, again, in my Synology, I have 10 terabyte drives in here. But I ran some cost analysis. And it seemed way more cost effective for me to buy four terabyte drives and build out this array than to just buy, at, buy 10, ter 10, terabyte drive, 10 terabyte drives. But in the future, maybe I'll just like replace these drives with 10 terabytes, and I won't need to buy another entire enclosure. But that's for something I need to think about down the road. Um, you can, um, so again, we're using FreeNAS. FreeNAS prefers that you run drives of the same capacity. Because again, if you're running like, if you're running a bunch of uh, four terabyte drives and you add a ten terabyte drive, like your data needs to be distributed across those evenly. So you're not going to be able to like, I think I, I haven't used Unraid, but Unraid is an alternative to FreeNAS. I think Unraid, what I've, from what I've read, it does a little bit better with drives of different sizes, but it's still it's still best practice to run. Um, drives that are the same capacity. Because again, you're distributing your data across multiple drives. It's just easier for the system if the drives are of equal capacity. Um, but again, just to, just to go back, once I'm, done that, once I'm done migrating everything over here, I'm not going to need that 24 base system, at least yet. So my options are either to sell it or to just save it. And I think I might save it because when eventually I max out this 36 base system, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be able to cascade. I'm going to be able to, be able to run another SAS cable to cascade from the rear, rear backplane to the backplane on the other um, FreeNAS box. So basically, at that point, I'm going to have 36 plus 24, which is what? Uh, why can't I do math? <laughs> um, I'm going to basically uh, 72. I'm going to have 72 drives worth of storage on the um, on the total to work with at that point. But at, at, that, at that point, I'm going to need to have like a massive server cabinet to, to hold uh, this unit and then another unit. So this is basically a 4U unit, if you know about server racks, things like that. This is 4U, which is four units worth of space. So you can imagine uh, if I run a 70, 72 bay array, it's going to be double the size. So this, this is going to have to live in a cabinet. Um, Oh, rebuild the, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I can technically rebuild. And again, that one's going to be empty at, at that point. So I can add bigger drives to that or new drives down the road. But again, th having 20 terabytes worth of usable storage, according to my calc, I, I ran a bunch of numbers. Basically, basically what I did was I calculated how many shows I film per year and roughly the average duration per band. So basically, in a given year, I'll film like 500 bands a year, let's say. I mean, 2020 was a fluke, but 20, let's say I film, um, let's do a quick math. So let's say I do, I film 500 sets a year, and the average band plays a 20 minute set. Let's say that's 10 gigabytes worth of storage, right? No, sorry, 10 terabytes. <laughs> Let me think of this. I have 500 sets, and each is uh, 20, let's say 20 gigs. Um, that is what, like uh, one terabyte per year? Um, so, sorry, that's 10 terabytes per year. 500 sets, each is uh, 
Someone can do the math for me. I'm, I'm, I'm like, my brain is fried from having like been, been talking all this time. Uh, but essentially, I did the math. I did the math basically uh, accounting for how many sets per year I film, the average set duration. Like the average, ba the average band, if you look at the site, the average band plays for 24 minutes, I think is the average runtime. And then so then I looked at the bit rate that I, that I record at, which is some um, like, let's say 50 megabits per second. So you can, you can actually calculate if I'm recording at 50 megabits per second, the average band plays 24 minutes, you can, you can figure out the average file size per set that I record. And um, basically the math worked out to, I should get about uh, three to four years worth of storage out of this before I need to start expanding it. Um, so that's that. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk, let me, let me close this back up. I feel like I'm, I'm like, I'm, um, I'm jumping around a lot because I did very little preparation. I did some preparation for this, this stream, but I, as you can see, I did, did not do a ton. Um, yes, so do I keep all the raw footage? So basically that's, that's what I'm storing. So when you're watching like the Jesus piece set from, this is hardcore, that is like four camera angles, like, I store all of the unedited raw camera angles on these drives. So what's streaming on the internet is the final like multicam for the four, um, four angle video with the soundboard feed, but I'm storing all of the original unedited footage on these systems. That's the reason why I need like all this space. Um, so the other thing that I want to talk about is Evan. We got Evan Jacobs in here. Um, Evan's a good friend of mine. Evan, I would not be doing what I'm doing if it was not for Evan Jacobs. Um, Evan Jacobs did the 108 documentary, Curse of Instinct, which took me many years to track down, but I tracked it down. I, I looked for it everywhere. This was in like 2004. I was trying to find, um, no, probably 2007, 2008. I was looking for a copy of his documentary on 108, uh, 108, 108 The Hardcore Band. He had a documentary where he followed their final tour in 95 called Curse of Instinct. And I heard about it, I read about it, and I couldn't find it anywhere. There was no online streaming. At the time, War was not able to find it, couldn't find it on any websites to buy. And in a last ditch effort, I found it in my college library of all places. So I emailed Evan, I said, hey Evan, I've been looking for it, just letting you know I found it in my library. And Evan was stoked. Evan was so stoked that his, his documentary that he filmed by himself was in a college library somewhere. So he like, he couldn't believe it. So uh, that was a cool moment. That was the moment Evan and I became friends. So it's cool to see Evan in, Evan in here. Um, what was I saying? Um, where was I at before I got the, um, got distracted by my Evan, not distracted. I got, I got, I got one of my Evan, Evan tangent here. Um, right, the RAID controller. So there are, again, there are different types of RAID. Like I said earlier on, there is a hardware RAID and a software RAID. So when you buy a, I have it right here. So when I bought this system from Supermicro, it actually came with this RAID controller here. So let's switch over to the overhead. It came with this. So this was actually where this card is. This was actually sitting here. So this is a uh, RAID controller. This is a AOCS2208L-8. H8IR RAID controller. So again, what a RAID controller does is it is essentially doing all the heavy lifting with all the parity checks and allowing the drives to communicate each other, allowing the drives to communicate with each other. That is more or less handled by the RAID controller. It's allowing the drives, it's doing all the communication between the drives. And then in the case of a drive failure, it's helping rebuild the data by figuring out like what is the parity bit or what data was lost, let's recover it. So the RAID controller is one of the most, if not the most important part of a RAID system. Obviously like you can have a powerful CPU and a lot of RAM, that's important, that's great. But if you can offload it to a dedicated RAID card, the better because these cards are built specifically for the task of doing those operations. And so it's generally highly advisable that you use some type of RAID card rather than using like a um, onboard RAID that is using your CPU. Now, 
The reason I did not use the RAID that came with the system is because, again, we're going to be installing FreeNAS. FreeNAS is a software RAID. And a lot of these enterprise grade RAID systems, they don't, they're not running software RAID. They're running hardware RAID. So the reason that I bought this one, I bought the uh, LSI 9305-16i. This is a $500 RAID card. The reason I got this is it supports up to 12 gigabits per second, um, and it is, which should be, which should be uh, powerful enough for me to like run both backplanes. And the other thing is, is that it allows you to flash the firmware. So in order to run FreeNAS, your, your RAID controller needs to run in something called IT mode. Again, here's where I'm reaching my limits of knowledge here. IT mode stands for initiate or target. I don't really know what that means. I think what that means is that when you're running a RAID controller in IT mode, all it is doing is it's saying, hey, I'm not going to run any RAID. I'm going to be basically, I'm going to be basically collecting all the drive, uh, access to all the drives, and I'm going to provide that to the software. So again, when you, that's why you need IT mode. Again, IT mode is basically saying, hey, I'm not going to do any of the rebuilding. I'm not going to do any of the like heavy lifting. I'm going to do I'm going to do some of the heavy lifting, but all I'm really being used for is to um, allow the drives to communicate through me, so I can pass it information to the the software RAID. In this case, FreeNAS. So FreeNAS is yes, it allows you to run uh, JBOD. JBOD is stands for just um, a bunch of disks. Um, software. Uh, I think running IT mode allows you to just run or access the drives as if like allows you to communicate with just a bunch of drives individually. Again, reaching my limits of knowledge here. Someone please correct me. I got some reading to do, but that's essentially why you need this. So you cannot run FreeNAS unless you are, are running IT mode on your RAID card. So again, I just bought this card. It was like 500 bucks. Um, it came in and the first thing that I had to do, which I will show you, is I had to flash the firmware. So it comes already with the firmware that you need to run it as a hardware RAID solution. But once I installed it, I booted up into the system, I flashed it with the software RAID, and then I was good to go. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, um, I think we're basically ready to boot this thing up. If anyone has any questions, we are, uh, we're about to get underway here. So actually, before we do that, I will show you roughly a quick overview on how you install um, FreeNAS. So again, we're going we're gonna to install it using this. Uh, just a So we're not using the thumb drive to boot. We're using the thumb drive to install. So um, let me switch over to, let's see. So in order to do that, you need something called Rufus. Um, Rufus is just a uh, way of creating a bootable, um, creating a bootable hard, basically a bootable drive. So I've already done this, so I'm not going to go through it. But really, all this is doing. Let's see, scroll up here. So I, I downloaded FreeNAS eleven point seven. ISO, there we go. So if you go, if you go to freenas.org, this is where you will download, um, if it shows up here, here we go. All right, so yes, this, this stream will be archived on the channel if you need to access it later. So if you go to freenas.org, you can actually download um, freenas 11.3 or truenas. Uh, people are moving over to TrueNAS, uh, I think TrueNAS is now the enterprise solution um, that IX Systems is providing in, in uh, enterprise businesses that need a NAS software NAS solution. But I think it's built on top of FreeNAS. So I'm not installing TrueNAS today. The reason for that is my old system, my old box is running. Again, I built that in 2016. That is running FreeNAS 9.3, which is really old. And so technically, you cannot up, there's no uh, direct path from upgrading from 
FreeNAS 9.3 to TrueNAS 12. So my, um, my general plan of attack right now is I'm basically going to install uh, FreeNAS 11.3 on this system. And then hopefully once I do, so I'm going to install 11.3. Um, and then I'm going to have to migrate the data from the old array to here. That might be a little tri tricky because, again, that's running 9.3. What might happen is I might actually have to upgrade the FreeNAS on the old box to 11, from 9.3 to 11. But from what I've read, that's a little risky. A lot, some people have had issues with that. So I might need to... Um, I might need to do upgrade from 9 to 10 and then 10 to 11. But I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so I'm a little nervous about like not being able to like recover everything. But that's the plan. The plan is 9.3 to 10, 10 to 11. And then this new box will have 11 already. I'll be able to like move physically, physically take out the hard drives from that system, physically plug them in here. And then um, I will be able to import those pools. So in FreeNAS, they call it they call them pools, like you're, you're pooling the drives together. So I'm going to import those pools into here. And then hopefully, once everything's A-OK, -okay, I'll be able to upgrade this to TrueNAS. So that's the plan with, um, with this. So right. So if you go to uh, freenas.org, you can download FreeNAS and TrueNAS, all that good stuff. It's just you're, you're going to download. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you a .iso file, which is an image. And an image is something that you can burn to a disk or write, you know, burn to a CD, DVD, or burn or write to a bootable floppy. And for that, you will use something called Rufus. And Rufus is basically going to say, hey, you know, you plug in your drive, you tell Rufus, hey, here's the ISO file that I want to write to the drive. And it's going to create a bootable drive of that image. So again, I've already, I've already ran, I ran this um, yesterday. So this, this thumb drive already has FreeNAS 11 ready to be in, um, for, for booting up. So we're going to plug this in, and then we will get this started. So th again, this is going to get kind of loud. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the fan in here. Hold on. This is, i got to do some cable management. How we got with questions? We're down. We're down. We're down to 53 people. We had, I think, almost like 150 people in here, and then I started talking about bitwise operators, exclusive OR, parity, and then I then my viewership dropped. But we still got 50 people in here. So hopefully, hopefully, if you're watching this, you're finding this helpful. Again, I did some preparation here, but I feel like I could have done a little bit more work to make this a better stream. But it is what it is. Um, there are plenty of other, and I, I, if you're, if you're going to start building your own, I highly recommend doing what I did and just watch a bunch of videos. There are so many walkthrough videos of people building their own systems. I suggest really um, just uh, building them out, like just watching as many build videos as you can because you will learn so much just from watching other people build. So that's that. I'm going to... If you want to see what this looks like, I'm going to plug in the, the power supply into here. So again, this just slides in. Turn that. There we go. OK, so the power supply is back in. I'm going to plug the power in. So actually, I'm going to also put the lid back on here. So when I, when I did my, I did a stream test yesterday. And even though this got pretty loud, you were still able to hear me. But just to be safe, I'm gonna I'm gonna just close this. What's happening here? Oh, God. it's not in here. Um, this this um, wind. Thing needs to. That should be. What? Okay. Yeah, I thought about creating a second channel. Maybe I should. I'm kind of lazy in terms of wanting to create other channels. Okay, so lids back on. Um, 
we're going to get the monitor ready here. So I, I have a monitor that you can't see on this shot, but you can actually see it if I cut to this. So you will actually be able to, we'll be able to see the, uh, the install process here in a second. Okay. I'm not giving a shout out to your friend because I, I see what you're doing here. I'm not going to fall for that one. I almost did. I almost fell for that. All right. So we're going to plug in the power. All right. So one, and two. And then let's see what happens. All right, so it's powering on. Can you hear that? It's pretty loud where I'm at. All right, so it's booting up. It's booting up. We're going to have to boot into the uh, BIOS in a second here. Let's see if I can. Let's see. System initializing. All right. So it's booting up. It's going to detect probably the uh, RAID controller and then the drives in a second here. Let's see. Let's boot into the... We're gonna go into the boot menu and make sure we're actually booting from the, the drive here. Yeah, see, it sounds like I'm fucking boarding a plane. That's why, um, that's why my other system lives in a soundproof enclosure because this gets really fucking loud. All right, so it's um, booting up, searching. So there we go, it found all the hard drives. Found, it found all 12 hard drives as well as the uh, RAID controller. So now we're gonna boot into Freenas. It's gonna take a minute. Here we go. All right, so we're gonna tell it to boot from the uh, we're going to tell it to boot from the uh, PNY USB stick, again, which has Freenas, the Freenas ISO in there. And so we're going to tell it to, um, the Freenas installer gives us a couple options to boot from. Uh, sorry, it gives us the option to install. We're just going to hit one. And now this is going to begin the process of installing. That is my, uh, that is my microwave and my toaster oven because we are doing the stream live from my kitchen, believe it or not. Okay, so now it's telling me, do we want to upgrade, install upgrade shell reboot system? We're gonna say uh, install, and then it's gonna ask us, it's gonna ask us what drive we want to install. Uh, Freenas on. So again, it's showing us all 12 of the drives, but we don't we don't want the operating system on the we don't want the operating system. We don't want Freenas on any of these drives. We want it on that uh, 2.5 inch um, tiny uh, hard drive that I mounted inside the case. So all that's going to do with that is where we're going to install Freenas, and we're going to keep these drives available just for. Um, creating our, our RAID Z3 volume. So we're going to say install onto here. Upgrading installation will preserve your existing configuration. Do you want to perform an upgrade or a fresh install? We're going to say fresh install. So user configuration settings and storage volumes are preserved and not affected. 
basically this is saying do we want to uh, start new or what? So we're gonna say install the new boot environment. This is giving us the warning um, that we're gonna lose all of our data if we do this. Again, there's, there's already nothing on here, so we can just say, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna give it a random password. Now, um, now it's asking us what kind of um, boot mode do we want. Do we want uh, BIOS or UEFI? Um, we're just gonna stick with the BIOS boot. And now it's gonna install, and this might take a little bit of time. So we're gonna let that run. If you have questions, let me know. But that's just gonna keep going. Um, we're, up to, we're up to 61 people watching, which is kind of crazy. But it is what it is. So it says we're installing base OS step one of four. So how's everyone doing? How's, how's everyone's New Year's Eve? I'm basically, once this is done, I'm gonna, I haven't eaten all day. Uh, it's already 2.30 where I'm at, so I'm gonna have a late breakfast. And then, um, I don't know. I honestly don't know what my plan is for tonight. Uh, okay, so great question. What am I using for, uh, the question from Ed is, what I'm using to convert old footage? So let me show you real quick here. Um, let's see if I can do this. Give me one second and I'll show you exactly how I'm doing old show footage tapes. Okay. So here is how I do, here's how I do my tape conversion. So basically I have an old mini DV camera. So uh, if you have tapes, mini DV tapes, this is roughly how you would do it. Uh, I'm basically running from the mini DV camera via Firewire into a laptop. The laptop has uh, a Firewire, I bought like a, a Firewire expansion port that just goes into here. And then, um, the camera, using a FireWire cable, will just plug directly into here. And then I use a capture program to just capture it. But the issue is that um, it's becoming very difficult to find a laptop or a computer with FireWire. FireWire is very outdated. So um, you can use an Elgato. Elgato is basically a USB device that allows you to convert your, um, allows you to uh, convert your tapes that way. Uh, it's technically not lossless. So the average person will not notice, but there's technically gonna be a little bit of uh, very significant, very little quality loss in uh, using a USB capture device, only because the, the, the rate at which a USB, you can pass data through USB is much lower than how much data you can push through a uh, FireWire. So at least that's what I've read. So I use FireWire. For the average person, I recommend just getting an Elgato. You'll be able to plug in your camera directly to that and that will plug into via USB and you can capture that way. If I'm capturing a VHS tape, I will plug the output of the VCR into the uh, camera via the AV input and then from the uh, FireWire out from the camera into the FireWire of the laptop. In both cases, the, the mini DD camera is just acting as the the digitizer. This is digitizing and encoding the analog signal into digital. But if you have an Elgato, the Elgato is doing the, the uh, encoding for you. So you don't technically need this, but that, this, is, this is how I do it. Uh, I have three of these laptops and a couple of these tapes, so a couple of these cameras. So I'm technically able to convert multiple tapes at the same time by running them on this little, uh, this little rack over here. Um, okay. I see that Evan is plugging his channel. Evan has some interesting movies on his channel. You might want to check them out. Um, all right, so this is done. So it says FreeNAS installation on ADA0 has succeeded. 
Please reboot the media. Please reboot, remove and please reboot and remove the installation of media. So I'm gonna do that. We're going to uh, reboot. I'm going to, in a second, unplug this. It's still doing its thing. So now I'm gonna unplug that. And we'll see what happens here. Uh, so I'm in my current rig, I'm not running a Ryzen. I'm running a uh, Intel i7-6950X on my main editing machine. Uh, let's see what happens. I, I might need to update the boot drive here. We'll see. We'll see what happens in a second. Um, in my main editing rig, uh, it's a Intel Core i7-6950 10 core CPU with 128 gigs of RAM, um, Titan X GPU. I do want to get a Ryzen one day. I think my next build, next time I, next time I need to build a editing machine, I'm going to go with a Ryzen 5950X. I don't know, we'll see. It's kind of pricey right now, but we'll see. But those, those Ryzen chips are looking pretty, pretty damn good. All right, so I think I need to I, th I think it's still trying to boot from the thumb drive. So um, we're gonna tell it to just boot from the... So what I'm, I'm in the BIOS right now. The BIOS just allows you to uh, change your boot configuration, choose, change the boot order. Do you wanna boot from this drive first or this drive first? So I'm basically telling it, hey, boot from the internal hard drive first and we'll be good to go. So we'll say save changes and reset. All right, we're getting there, we're getting there. This is, this is gonna get pretty interesting pretty soon. If it's not already interesting, it's gonna get even more interesting. So we're still booting up. All right, so it should detect the RAID controller and then the drives. Let's see. There we go. Looking mighty nice, okay. So now, I know it looks like it's doing an infinite loop, but it's not. It's actually still booting up. There, it's finding the drives again. There we go. So now we want to, so again, we don't have, uh, we, we unplug this, right? We unplug the uh, Freenas boot image. So it's finding Freenas on the hard drive, which is good. So we're gonna tell it to just boot Freenas. And so this is gonna do its thing. So what we're gonna do is, um, once this is done booting up, uh, I'm gonna show you how we can log into, we're gonna be able to log into this machine. Because uh, technically, I don't even, I don't have a monitor plugged into, I do not have a monitor plugged into my current RAID system, my current FreeNAS box. There's no monitor attached to it. I connect to it remotely over the network. So 
What we're gonna do once this is done uh, booting up is I'm gonna show you how I connect to this box over uh, my local area network. And there's a nice graphical user interface and we're gonna be able to uh, create our volumes. And then the, the other thing I'll show you is how we can then access the data on this drive over the network by an, another computer. So, so now it's starting up, it's looking for the uh, looking for the ethernet connection. There's actually four ethernet ports on this. So if you want like a, a fail safe, whatever, you can do link ag aggregation. Uh, there are technically four gigabit ethernet ports that come with this super micro. Oh, that's, that's right. I did not tell you which uh, super micro motherboard I have. Uh, this is the uh, X9 DRI-LN 4F plus super micro motherboard. Okay, so we're getting there. We're almost, almost at the uh, boot screen. All right, starting plugins. Here we go. There we go. We are, we are now in business. So as you can see here, it says the web user interface is at 192.168.108.162. So I'm gonna switch over to um, a web interface so you can actually see what I'm doing. So we're gonna just, we're gonna type that in, 192.168.108.162. And there we go. We are now, we are given this uh, screen here. So we're gonna log in with the username and password that you set up during the installation step. Uh, why is this happening? What did I do wrong? I did something wrong. Okay, it's not happy. I think I entered the wrong password, so let me reset the password here. Um, all right, password successfully changed. I mean, worst case scenario, I gotta go through and... Why is it doing that? Oh, I know what I did. I was logging in. I was logging in under uh, under admin, and the login is actually root. The username is root, not admin. That's what happened. Okay, so now we're in here. Um, let's see. Okay, so now we're gonna go under storage here. We're gonna go to uh, pools. No, not pools yet. We're gonna go to import disks. No, not that. Where is it? Storage. Disks. Okay, so, yeah, sorry. It's root, not admin. Uh, okay, so what I'm showing you now is what we're looking at. Um, I'm gonna show you the steps that we take in order to, so again, we have, we have uh, 12 hard drives in here. We are now going to create one virtual volume with it. Um, this is called creating a pool. So we're gonna create a pool and then we're gonna create a data set within that pool. You can think of it as like, a, the pool is like your C drive on your, uh, on your, on your desktop, like your main hard drive and then your, um, Sorry, your pool is like your, 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 your disk. Your data set is more or less your partition within that hard drive. So, you know, you could have a hard drive that has multiple partitions. Like this partition is just for videos. This partition is just for the operating system, so on and so forth. You can loosely think of your data sets as a partition within your, within your pool. So, um, what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna go to, uh, on the left-hand side, storage, Pools, add, and then we're gonna say create a new pool. 
we're just gonna call this um, uh, pool two, I'll call it pool two. No, let me call this something else. Eh, whatever, it's fine. I'm gonna call this, um, test pool for now. We're gonna select all of the drives. So again, these are four terabyte drives, but they're, they're only showing up as 3.64 terabytes. Um, tibabytes, I should say. In Freenas, it's, it's dealing with tibabytes. Uh, so we're gonna move them over here, these, available, these 12 available disks. We're gonna select all of them as virtual devices. We're gonna say, okay, hopefully you can see this still, yep. It's giving us the option of what kind of a RAID we want to create. So again, we could do a striped RAID, a mirror, RAID Z, RAID Z2, RAID Z3. If we do striped, uh, that's giving us 43.64 terabytes. That's basically using, again, the full capacity of all the drives. If we are using mirror, uh, that should give us half of it. Uh, why is it only giving us 3.64? Oh no, so it, mirror, mirror, is, mirror is basically taking the data and, and copying it across all the same, copying that data identically across all the drives. So if we run this configuration in a mirror, as a mirror, we're only gonna get four terabytes worth of, of storage. We don't want that. We're gonna run RAID Z3. This is giving us 32.73 tibabytes worth of uh, storage capacity and giving us three drives worth of redundancy. So again, we can lose three drives and we will not lose any data, but we will need to populate the drives. Uh, we will need to replace the drives with new ones fairly quickly. The only, the only other thing I wanna, I wanna mention about rebuilding is, yeah, RAID is great. Even if a drive dies, you don't lose anything. Uh, you do need to replace that drive but the rebuild process is very taxing on the hard drives because what, what it's doing is like, if a, if a drive dies, the other drives have to go bit by bit working with the RAID controller to figure out what was missing. So you're, 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 you're taxing those hard drives by doing a lot of reads. It's reading every bit on the drive and then figuring out, okay, here are the bits, let's repopulate what was missing. That is a very uh, expensive operation to do on your drive. So, it is not uncommon when, to, when you're doing a rebuild, so when, you're, when, when a drive dies and you replace it with a new one, during your rebuild process, it is not uncommon to have other drives fail during your rebuild because you're stressing the hell out of those drives trying to rebuild that missing data. So it's unfortunately um, not uncommon that during a rebuild, you will lose other drives. So just to warn you, that is why you need a backup. So a RAID will give you redundancy, but it will not give you a, a safe backup. Um, yeah, this would cost quite a bit if it was um, <laughs> if I was running all SSDs. So okay, so now we have uh, we've selected all 12 drives. We're gonna say, let me move my monitor here. Okay, so now we can see it. Um, we're gonna say create. We're gonna confirm the creation of this volume. Create pool. That's gonna run. It's gonna take a minute. If I switch to this, so it's saying, uh, it's preparing the drives. It's basically saying, hey, this device is getting ready for the, um, to, to build out the, the RAID. And the larger the volume, the, uh, the longer this takes. But again, this is only 12 drives we're creating with this volume. So there we go. Now it says healthy, a healthy pool called test pool has been created with uh, 30.62 terabytes free. So now we have, essentially we've created a volume. Uh, within this volume, I'm going to create a data set. I'm just gonna call it test data set. Uh, I'm gonna say that the share type is a Windows only because I'm primarily accessing this data from Windows machines. Yes, I still use Windows. I'm editing everything on Windows machines. So uh, that's that. We're gonna say save. Now, 
I'm gonna go under accounts here and I'm gonna create a new user. And I'm gonna call this uh, just hate five six. Uh, and we're gonna save this. So what we're about to do is I'm gonna show you how we can now access this drive over the network. So that's that. If I go down to uh, sharing and I'd go to SMB and I click add, this is gonna, we're gonna enable SMB Samba, which is gonna allow us to access this net drive over the network. So we're gonna, the, the path to this is gonna be that's cool. So that's data set. I'm gonna allow guest access just for the purpose of this demo. We're gonna enable the service. Okay. Now, if I go under services, SMB, edit this. Guest account. I'm going to set the guest account to hate five six. We're going to save that. Okay, so now let me see if I can. Um, whoa, oh shit. Okay. We are going to go to the IP address here, 192.168.108.162. It's gonna ask me for my login. It's not accessible, why is that not accessible? Hold on, I did something wrong here. 192.168.108.162. Test pool. Oh, I have a comma here, not a one. There we go. I cannot type today. Test pool. What is happening here? Um, double backslash, doesn't like that. So I had this issue yesterday, um, trying to figure out what I did to fix it. So let me switch back over to, display. so there was something I did yesterday to, to get this to work. Let me see if I can figure that out. Um, storage. Tools, edit permission. Give me one second here. One, two. Of course, once I go live, I have an issue with this. Hold on. But this is the joy of doing a, a live stream. And it, will, it also shows you that I don't have all the answers. So, um, What did I do here? Edit permissions. Data type. I go under sharing, Windows SMB, edit, allow guest access, sure. 
Trying to remember what I did. Maybe there's someone in here who has done this. Let's see. It's something stupid. It's something like, yeah, I've tried turning it back on. I might put it in a bowl of rice next. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Storage, tools, services, sharing. Services, SMB, Trying to see if it's like a permission issue. Uh, hold on. Ah, <laughs> oh, motherfucker! Hold on. What am I doing wrong? All right, let me start this from... It's something stupid that I remember like, because I was having this issue yesterday when I couldn't access the share. So then I did something, what did I do?
Let's do this. Let's do... All right, we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna figure this out. I'm, I'm losing I'm losing viewers right now, but that's fine. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna do this. I'm going to storage tools. I'm gonna recreate this pool from scratch. So while that's here, let's do this. Uh, add. So while this is going, I'll show you. Oh, okay. So I'll show you what my other FreeNAS box looks like. So if I go to FreeNAS, uh, this should show up. This isn't going to work either, is it? Okay, so this is the, um, uh, we're looking at the, uh, my other array, so my existing array that's behind me. So I currently, again, I have, the, I have the two volumes in here. Let me see if I can change the, so you can actually see this. So again, I have a 856 and 8562. 856 volume one is, uh, this is my 40 terabyte. Um, this is gonna be the 40 terabytes that I have in the existing volume. And I'll show you basically how I have all my footage uh, sorted out here. So basically, let's see, extra large icons. So for every band, I have uh, a directory. So if I go to 108, so here's every 108 set I have. There's a set from 95, uh, 2009, 11, so on and so forth. Let's see if I can make this larger so you can see it. So basically every band has a directory and then within each band directory is a date corresponding to the date that I have footage from. So for example, this 108 set from uh, May 28th, 2016. I don't know what this is, let's find out. Oh, this is uh, Rainfest. This is when 108 played uh, Rainfest in 2016. So, but that's, that's basically it in terms of what I do uh, with respect to creating these, uh, storing my data across these volumes is there's a uh, volume and then each band has a directory, and then each band has a date corresponding to the date of the show, and then all the footage from that show is in that directory. So that's, that's the first volume, and then again, I have a second volume, volume two, which is everything that does not fit on volume one. So again, this is another 10, ter uh, 10 terabytes worth of footage here. Um, let's see here. So, I don't know, type in a band, Vane. We got some Vane, Vane sets here from 2019, July 6th, September 7th, October 11th. So, 
that's largely how I do it. And so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to, and so my computer is seeing that volume as a single hard drive. And again, that's just, that's on that system. So what I'm trying to do right now with this box is create a volume that I can then access over the network. So that's, that's um, what's happening here. When did I film 50 Caliber? Uh, I think I filmed 50 Caliber at, in London, maybe? I think that was London. Um, we can find out. Um, let's see. Let's see. When did I film 50 Caliber? This was December 16th, 2017. That should be London, actually, let's see. <laughs> yeah, this was in London somewhere, I can't remember. The, the, the set is on the site, so if you wanna go check it out, look up uh, 50 Cal, it's up there. Um, okay, okay, okay. So, what's happening here? All right, volume is created. So now let's try this again. Add a data set. Data set. Windows, save. So now I'm gonna go to Edit permissions, then we're gonna go down to sharing, SMB, add. Services. Now I'm gonna to go to accounts, users. I'm gonna recreate. Let's change my permissions here. Update that, we'll go into services, SMD. Okay, so now I'm gonna try this again. Windows cannot access, why? Oh, this is so annoying. It's not, it's a permission issue. It's complaining that I don't have permissions.
So if I go down to services, SMB, Okay, trying a couple different things here. Um, ah, okay, I figured it out, great. Okay, so I'll show you what I did. Oh, that was a fucking headache. All right, um, let's go down to here. So basically I had, like I said, I, I did a test build yesterday. So I, I already had this art like built out. Um, I forgot that I, I already had it mounted to a drive letter and that was the issue. I basically, I already had the IP address mounted and I couldn't mount it again. So I disconnected that mount and then here's what I did. So if I go to uh, do this from scratch, go up here, 192.168. There we go. It opens up the data set and this is where we're at. So technically, uh, if I want to map this, how do I do that within Windows? Um, share. Um, here we go. So if I right click this, here, let, me, let me make this larger so you can see it. Uh, large icons. I say map network drive. I'll give it the drive letter Z. I hit finish. So if I go down to if I go to my computer. Oh, hold on. Sorry, you probably couldn't see anything that I just did. Let me let me redo that so you can see it. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Disconnect. So we're gonna say add a network location. Choose a network, choose a custom network location. We're gonna add in 192.168.108.162. Slash pool, not that, sorry. Not that, what the fuck? That works, if I, basically if I go into uh, uh, the Windows Explorer and I type in, in the, uh, the address bar at the top, 192.168.108.162, uh, it shows me the data set, which I've called D set. So if I right click this and say map network drive, I'll assign it to the drive letter Z. Hit finish. So now this pops up. So now we have access to our network drive. So what's cool now is I can actually copy over. Um, let's see here. if I copy over just like a random file. So I'm gonna to go to my downloads, I'm trying to find like a large file, whatever. This is just a random video file, copying it over. So that's that, that's in there. Now, if I go to Freenas, so to prove to you that it's actually in there still, I'm gonna go down to the shell. So now I'm logged into the, I'm basically logged into the, the, the FreeNAS box through the shell. Shell is basically the, uh, the same thing as this. This is the shell, but we're on it through the web interface. So if I go down, if I go to CD mount LS and then CD pool, LS CD deset, 
there we go. We'll see that we have the file here that we just copied over. Fuck, I keep forgetting to show you what I'm doing. Let me do this again. So um, CD mount pool CD D sets LS LSS. So we see that the file that I just copied over, which is H5C-790, blah, 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 that's copied in here. So that's, that's in there. Um, and now technically, technically, if I wanted to go to my other computer and type in this network location, I can access this file. Now, um, just to show you that the RAID is actually working the way that it should, let me find a... Uh, hold on. Okay, so to show you that the RAID is actually working, we can actually copy a file over from my computer to this. And while it's copying over, I'm gonna pull a drive out. We'll see what happens. So let's see what happens if I do that. So I'm gonna get ready to pop this drive out. So. I'm going to pop this guy out while I'm copying the file over. So, paste, pull the drive out. It's still good. It's still copying and it should still be accessible. So even if I, uh, so again, I've taken, the, I've taken this drive out here. Hopefully you can see it. This drive is out. Um, Now, if I double click on this video file, it should play. So that's playing. So that's playing. It's playing just as fine, even though I've disconnected this drive completely. So that's how we know that the RAID is working as expected. So that's, that's about it. Um, I feel like I've covered everything that I wanted to show. Um, Oh, I did not show you how to flash the RAID. So I found that here, I'll switch over to Give me one second and I'll uh, pull this up. So I found this site yesterday when I was trying to figure out how to flash the, uh, flash the RAID controller, I found this. This is a pretty straightforward tutorial. So basically all you have to do is you log in to the, um, uh, you open up the shell from the web, web interface, or you can actually do it from the, um, the console, whatever, as long as you have access to the shell, you can, you can do it. But basically you need to, um, you're gonna run this command, which was sas3 flash dash list all. So if I go here and I go to sas3 flash dash list all, it shows you the, the sas controller. So, um, So it says here we have the SAS uh, 3224A1 firmware version 16. So initially when I installed, when I initially installed this card, it was running firmware nine something. But in, again, I needed to turn, the, I needed to flash the firmware to run in IT mode, which was firmware 16, which according to this website, um, according to this, uh, I needed firmware 16. So it actually gave me the download link, so I ran I just ran this, which is wget. Wget is how you download uh, within the shell. So, boom, boom. So I ran this, I downloaded it, and then I basically ran this other command that they said, which I'm not gonna do right now, but I'll show it to you. Uh, yeah, these, these are the commands that they suggested running, basically. Uh, you run sas3 flash dash c zero. Zero indicates which 
RAID controller, I only have the one RAID controller, which shows up as zero. If I had multiple RAID controllers, it would show up as zero, one, two, three, and so on and so forth, and I would need to flash each one. So basically, I ran SAS3 flash dash zero uh, dash F, and then the file name that I just downloaded, I ran that in the uh, console uh, here. SAS3 flash dash C0 dash F, and then I ran the, uh, the file. Again, I'm not gonna run it right now, but I ran that, and then uh, it, took, it took, like, took like a minute, but then it flashed the firmware. Then I was able to actually access these drives and then create a pool within Freenas. Um, and that was that. So that's basically it. Um, we've been streaming for two and a half hours. That's basically all I wanted to cover was showing you, uh, basically explaining roughly how RAID works using parity and why uh, using a bunch of external drives isn't always the best. Then I talked a little bit about uh, using a Synology disk station, which I still use as a backup. I talked about why RAID and backups are not the same thing. Redundancy and backups are not identical. Um, then I walked through the hardware of this system. Again, I got this entire thing. I got the chassis and then the, the, the uh, components uh, off eBay for about 600 bucks, but then I had to buy the four terabyte, four, the 12 four terabyte hard drives, which were close to 2000 bucks. And then, um, so I showed you all that. We went through the installation process of Freenas 11.3. I showed you my old Freenas box. And um, I showed you how to then, mat once you have the uh, Freenas installed, I showed you how to uh, create a pool, a, a volume, then uh, mount that volume within Windows. And you can do this within uh, Mac OS, whatever, whatever, whatever operating system you're running, you can do the same thing. You can create a volume on your uh, storage NAS and then access that as a single unified drive within your operating system. So I showed you that. Um, that's basically it. And then again, I'm not gonna do it today, but my next steps are to upgrade my uh, old NAS from, from free NAS 9.3 to 10, and then from 10 to 11. And then once I have it, it running uh, on 11, I'm gonna be able to then physically take out those drives, put them in here, and then um, import those volumes into this NAS. So, um, so why didn't this original controller work? So the reason that this original controller did not work was this only allows a hardware RAID. It does not, they don't, they, uh, I was not able to flash uh, this into IT mode. So again, in order to run FreeNAS, you need, um, your RAID controller needs to support IT mode, which is initiate or target. And more or less what that allows you to do is run a software RAID because by default, these run a hardware RAID, and I did not want to run a hardware RAID. I wanted to run FreeNAS and run RAID Z3, which is a purely software RAID. So that's the reason I could not use this. And again, like, um, I don't think this has the throughput that I needed. The throughput of the new card in here is 12 gigabits per second, which I think, again, I don't know, and I need to figure out if I can run, I don't even know if I can run 12 gigabits through the, first backplane because it's a single expander backplane. Uh, so I might be capped at six gigabits per second, but I do want to test it. I want to see if I can actually uh, double the throughput on it. But I do think having the 12 gigabits per second from what I understand will be useful for me uh, in terms of using this other, the rear backplane. So again, the way that I have this set up is the uh, RAID controller, the uh, LSI 9305, the, the, the thing that I just bought, that is connected to the front back plane, and then I'm cascading from the rear, from the front back plane to the rear back back plane, so that Freenas and the RAID controller see this, see both back planes as one back plane. But I'm wondering, and I don't know if there's a benefit here to doing this, but there are technically three open ports on the RAID controller, so I might actually, and I don't know the pros and cons to this. I need to figure this out. But rather than cascading from the front to the back. What if I just connect the rear backplane to one of the open ports on the, ra the, uh, the, uh, the RAID controller so that the RAID controller is going independently to each um, backplane? I don't know if that's better or worse. 
I want to figure that out. But like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching myself all this stuff as I go. I am not an expert on this stuff. I know just enough to get me by. Get my, get me by. But that's basically the, the whole purpose of the stream was to give you a memory dump of everything that I know about building your own free NAS box. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say. That's about it. I'm gonna power this down because it's loud and I'm not, I'm not gonna do the migration today. Basically, sometime next week, I'm going to uh, finish the migration over here. And then hopefully pretty soon, this will be living in my noise proof enclosure and it won't be as loud in my living room. So that's about it. Um, thank you all for supporting the channel, for watching the videos, enjoying it. Um, the reason that I do these behind the scenes videos is to show you the amount of like technology that goes into running 856 at the level that I'm running at. Um, because I'm, I'm, basically, I'm basically filming and archiving videos at such, such a high rate that I need to be able to back up the videos uh, securely and have some redundancy to those backups as well. So um, again, you don't need to do this. You can buy externals, you can host things in the cloud, but for me, I wanted to uh, build it, to say that I built it, to know that I, to also know how it works so that I can maintain it. And um, yeah, that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to DM me. Um, there is a tech talk channel on the 856 Discord. So if you are a member of 856 on Patreon, you have access to the Discord server. You can ask me questions on there. I'm more likely to respond there. But if you have other questions, feel free to DM me. I cannot promise you that I can solve all of your problems with this stuff. So if you decide to take the leap and go down this route, you might be on your own. I can try to help you, but there are plenty of uh, forums. There's like Reddit threads. There are free NAS forums where if you have questions, you can go there and ask. And there are countless people worldwide who are very eager to help you build your own NAS. So if you run into problems and I can't help you, um, there will be someone who can help you. But that's basically it. Uh, I'm gonna kill the stream and, um, and that's about it. Again, uh, just to say, if, if you have not joined HFS6 on Patreon, do not sign up today because you will be double charged today and then tomorrow, which is the first of the month. So I don't want that to happen to you. So I highly recommend if you wanna join the HFS6 Patreon, wait until the beginning of January. Otherwise you will get billed today and you'll get billed tomorrow and that would suck. So sign up tomorrow if you wanna sign up. You can either sign up on a per monthly basis, which is about two, two bucks or five bucks, depending on which tier you want, or you can sign up for the year and get two months for free. So uh, if you sign up for the $2 tier, you can sign up uh, for the full year at $20 and save, uh, get two months off. Same with the $5 tier, you can sign up for the full year, get two months free, so on and so forth. All the information is on Patreon. Um, yeah, only other things I wanna announce, um, basically no shows are happening still. I'm, I'm still planning on more live streams. So I have a couple live streams lined up with bands in January and February. Probably gonna have to continue after the spring because I don't think we're gonna have shows in the spring. Uh, the Have Heart sets are coming. I say that every time, but they are literally coming early 2021. The Have Heart shows are coming. There will be an announcement about that. Um, so stay tuned. I'm still digitizing tapes. So basically my 2021 right now is focused on getting the heart, Have Heart sets kicked off, digitizing old show tapes, which I will be storing on this, thankfully, because I need this to work. And uh, I will be doing more live streams if you are a member of 856 on Patreon, you will get access to bonus content from the live stream. So whenever I do live streams um, with bands, Patreon subscribers get access to a bonus encore, which is the band playing another song or two. You will get access to a rig rundown. The band will go through, talk about the gear that they use, and then you'll get access to a drum cam of that performance. So all that is on the, um, on the Patreon. So, your support is making it possible for me to like build this stuff so I can save all this footage. It's also allowing me to do the live stream. So your Patreon support goes a long way in terms of making the channel run at this level of volume, as well as allow me to provide bands a way to do live streams that are either free or basically free for them to do because this stuff is expensive, but Patreon subscribers are what subsidize the entire production cost. But that's my entire Patreon spiel. Um, 
I'm gonna sign off and make, make a late lunch and uh, relax for the rest of the day because it's New Year's Eve. I'm eager to say fuck off to 2020 and I'm sure many of you are eager to say to welcome 2021. So I wish you all a happy and safe new year. And uh, even though everything is not gonna get fixed tomorrow, it is a sort of mental fresh start and hopefully we will be able to take that energy and uh, make the changes that we need to make in order for us to get back to having shows again, get back to being able to see our loved ones, seeing our friends, businesses reopening. Um, some sense of normalcy would be great. So let's take this energy that we have in our excitement for 2021 and make sure we are able to get to where we need to be. So um, yeah, I'm gonna try to relax, Evan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch a movie tonight, maybe take a bath. I don't know, we'll see, but um, cool. Again, if you have any questions, DM me anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I have DMs turned, they're turned on, but you have to like, I have to approve you, but I will read your message. So shoot me a message, we'll go through there. Have a good day.